So we talked about um, just general central sensitivity syndromes and um, headaches and red flags for headache. Um, we're going to start now talking about some other pain syndromes. So um, two syndromes that involve other systems in addition to the pain matrix are um, complex regional pain syndrome, which involves the somatosensory, autonomic, and motor systems, and chronic low back pain syndrome, which involves muscle guarding disuse and other abnormal movements. So um, since those guys are a little bit different from the other ones we've talked about, we're going to talk about them separately. So complex regional pain syndrome, um, it's a syndrome of pain, vascular changes, and atrophy. Um, and they usually are um, in, in one individual region. That it, so the signs and symptoms present in a regional distribution, meaning it's not dermatomal, it's not peripheral nerve, it's regional, like an upper limb or a lower limb, rather than um, a nerve root distribution or a peripheral nerve distribution. So the signs and symptoms are usually worse in the distal part of the extremity. Um, so they might affect the entire hand or foot. Um, it's usually a an aberrant response to trauma. So it most frequently it follows surgery, a fracture, a crush injury, um, or a sprain, and the the healing does not go normally, basically. So you could have all those things, surgery, fracture, crush injury, and sprain, and have normal healing and not go into complex regional pain syndrome. Um, but usually with, um, it's really variable between, between the time of the trauma and the onset of um, CP, CRPS. So from hours to weeks. A lot of times I've, um, the people that I've seen with complex regional pain syndrome, I, I've seen three people with upper extremity and, and several with lower extremity over the course of the last um, 10 years. So um, it's not real common. Um, sometimes they will suspect complex regional pain syndrome when somebody is not getting better after a surgery. Um, the primary complaint in um, CPRS, CRPS, sorry, <laughs> is spontaneous pain, severe spontaneous pain that's out of proportion with the original injury. So um, the pain's usually aggravated either by psychological or physical stimuli. Um, sometimes people have sens uh, sensitivity to cold, pressure, or touch, even light touch. Um, it's really, really important that people get therapy. Um, in the earlier stages, it's that sensitivity to touch. Um, the, usually the skin looks red or pale. Um, excessive sweating, edema, and skin atrophy. And so the excessive sweating and the red or pale skin colors, those are sort of the autonomic um, part of it. It used to be called um, reflex sympathetic dystrophy because of sympathetic nerve activation, um, but now it's called complex regional pain syndrome. Um, so the, you get the early signs with the swelling and the edema. Um, there's a photograph in the book where it, it's comparing the two, and you can see the difference in color between the person's two feet. You can see the difference in edema. Um, later on, those are sort of the early symptoms, later on the skin becomes more dry and cold and the joints become stiff and swollen. Um, if it's allowed to progress to a later stage, you can actually get irre irreversible muscle atrophy, um, osteoporosis, and arthritic changes. So um, besides the um, autonomic and the um, somatosensory changes, you also get motor signs. Um, and so the motor signs that can be associated with this are um, paresis, which is um, partial, partial loss of uh, movement, spasms, and tremor. So there, there's a listing for the um, criteria for complex regional pain syndrome. Um, continuous pain that's disproportionate to the inciting event. Um, the patient reports at least one item um, in 
each category. So there has to be a sensory category. Um, they have to have a vasomotor, so temperature or skin color problems. Um, the pseudomotor, which is edema or sweating abnormalities. And a motor trophic, so muscle weakness, tremor, um, hair or nail um, abnormalities. So a lot of times um, it's treated in therapy with aquatic therapy, desensitization therapy, um, sometimes graded motor imagery, um, and uh, mirror therapy is, uh, can be used for complex regional pain syndrome. Um, when they do pain medications, a lot of times they'll use an implanted pump because it allows lower drug doses and increases the drug effectiveness over time. Um, complex regional pain syndrome is not something that people recover from quickly, so um, you have to think about long-term treatment. Um, the interesting thing is there's not, a, there's not a real clear demographic. It's not women more than men or adults more than children. Um, it actually affects, it can affect people across the board. So, um, kind of interesting. Chronic low back pain syndrome. Low back pain, whether it's chronic or acute, um, it is a hugely common disabling disorder that places a burden on individuals and society with associated loss of work and medical costs. It is a hugely impacting um, thing in our society. Um, in the U.S., it's proposed that low back pain has a point prevalence. And when we talk about point prevalence, remember prevalence is um, defined by a period of time. Like you'll say this many people have it in a month or this many people have it in a year and a geographical um, designation. In the United States, it's proposed that low back pain has a point prevalence, meaning at any given point in time, like right this minute, um, from 6 to 33% of people, adults, have low back pain. Um, and a one-year prevalence of from 22 to 65% of adults have low back pain. So really common. Um, the lifetime prevalence of low back pain has been estimated at, a, at approximately 84%. So it's very, very prevalent in our society. So the interesting thing is most low back pain is self-limiting. So 90% of patients will recover in three to four months with no treatment, just on their own. 70% will recover in one month with no treatment. 50% will recover in two weeks with no treatment. And 5% um, of the remaining 10% will not respond to conservative care, such as physical therapy. And um, this is from two studies that were done in um, 2001. So um, that's amazing, isn't it? The prevalence and the um, economic impact are so huge, but yet a lot of people recover with no treatment. But that having been said, um, it is one of the most common reasons that people come to physical therapy. So. Um, in that same study in um, 2001, it was said that in 60 to 80 percent of Americans in their lifetime will suffer a low back pain episode resulting in loss of work. So that's a huge number. Five percent of Americans have low back pain yearly resulting in loss of work and two percent of that five percent are related to their occupation. So they're, they have an occupation where they, ha they lift or they move patients or something like that. 1% um, of the um, population in industrialized countries is totally disabled from low back pain. So it's this, I'm just telling you all these statistics because I just want you to see the impact that low back pain has on society. So that 10% of people really interesting um, study was done where they compared like the chance of returning to work by based on how much work you had missed. Um, if somebody is six months out of work with low back pain, they have a less than 40% chance, chance of ever returning. If they're a year out of work with low back pain, they have a less than 20% chance of ever returning to that same job. 
And if they're two years out of work with low back pain, they have a nearly 0% chance of ever returning. So um, that's why it's really important for people to get back to work, even if they're doing light duty. Um, there are some huge factors that we're going to talk about um, in recovery from low back pain. So um, really uh, interesting. There are a lot of uh, really cool uh, risk factors and everything. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in this lecture because I could go on forever, <laughs> like I was saying. But um, a lot of, um, there are a lot of factors that contribute to low back pain. So how do we distinguish between acute and chronic um, for low back pain? The, um, we talked about chronicity before. Oh, the one other thing I wanted to mention from, from um, uh, studies done in 2010 and 2011 is in the United States alone, um, the uh, treatments for low back pain directly cost over $50 billion annually, whereas indirect costs for low back pain are estimated at $7.4 billion to $19.8 billion, and that's in lost work hours and that sort of thing. So um, incremental costs for low back pain exceed $26 billion a year, um, which is staggering. <laughs> and so there's a huge economic impact for low back pain. So 25% um, of individuals with neck or low back pain visit a healthcare provider. So 75% of people don't even seek um, care, which a lot of them are going to get better on themselves, so they do fine with it. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so, you know, people with low back pain, they're treated by physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, and occupational therapists. So, um, so we get uh, we get a lot of them. So, the sort of the classification for low back pain for acute versus chronic, um, or acute, subacute, and chronic, is um, usually the uh, one week range is considered acute. Um, the two to six weeks is considered subacute, and um, beyond 12 weeks is considered chronic. So if you've had low back pain continuously for more than 12 weeks, it's considered chronic. So the transition from acute low back pain to chronic low back pain has been characterized as a change in pain etiology from tissue damage to a physiologic impairment consisting of muscle guarding, abnormal movement, and disuse syndrome. So the brain scans on patients with low back pain with idiopathic chronic low back pain show amplified pain signals in patients um, who have this. So that's why it's considered a neuropathic pain syndrome. So medications that when we, in, with, for, um, Fibromyalgia, sometimes medications are used. For chronic low back pain, sometimes medications are used. Um, for both of those, exercise has consider, has uh, been shown to be a, an effective um, treatment. So um, exercise, that's something we can prescribe. Um, medications, they have to go to their doctor for. Um, tricyclic antidepressants are used in lower doses than for um, depression. The um, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, which are also antidepressants, um, are sometimes used. And tramadol, um, it is an opioid agonist, meaning it binds to opioid receptors, even though it's not an opioid itself. But it weakly inhibits the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So all of those things um, are used for fibromyalgia and, cr and chronic low back pain syndrome. A lot of the people I see with fibromyalgia, they have given up on medications because they're not getting any relief from them. So they're looking for another answer. Um, surgical treatment of chronic pain, in theory, a dorsal rhizotomy should alleviate pain, but it often fails in practice. Um, interestingly enough, um, that with um, pain matrix dysfunction,
interestingly enough, um, anything you do in a pain matrix dysfunction that affects the um, peripheral system is not going to have the effect that you want because you're not working on the system that's giving you the pain.